life. How's my hair look? <laughs> Fantastic. You've All been right. using that new foam. Sound brows look great, dude. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Symmetry Nation. How's it going? On the builder's call, we got 30 minutes, Brando. And we have, a very, we have a very special guest, so we're not going to say much at all because y'all are going to hear us for a little little more than an hour probably on the next call, B-Dub. So we will hand it over to you and our special guest, man. I'm very excited about this. It's going to be a good way to kick things off. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to jump right into the deep end of the pool and allow me to uh, introduce our special guest who says it's okay to call him Jim, but I'm going to introduce him first as Dr. Jim Lair. He's the co-founder of the Human Performance Institute, a world-renowned performance psychologist and author of 18 books, including his most recent, Wise Decisions, a science-based approach to making better choices. That's one that we're all going to have to read. And of course, he's also co-authored the national bestseller, The Power of Full Engagement, that we're going to talk about uh, today quite a bit. And um, I could go on and on in the bio, but... Uh, let me just share a couple things. One is that he's worked with hundreds of world-class performers from uh, the arenas of sports, business, medicine, and law enforcement, including Fortune 100 executives, FBI hostage rescue teams, military special forces. I know some of us can really appreciate that one. Um, and a sampling of his elite clients from the world of sport include golfers Mark O'Meara, Justin Rose, Daniel Berger, tennis players Jim Courier, Monica Sellis, Boxer Ray Mancini, hockey players Eric Lindros and Mike Richter, two of my favorites from back in the day. I'm a big hockey fan. Uh, and Olympic gold medal speed skater Dan Jansen. Dr. Lair has been inducted into three Hall of Fames, was a pioneer in the application of psychology to human performance. And, uh, you know, we could go on and on. So grateful for you, the doctorate in psychology. You're a full member of the American Psychological Association. But let's go ahead and start. Uh, just a little bit of fun, Jim. We like to have fun and get stuff done around here. Uh, where do you live? What does fun look like these days? And anything else you want us to know about you that could be interesting? Well, thank you, Brian. First of all, it's great to, to have this opportunity to meet everybody. I'm very excited. I love to be around high performers. And obviously, that's what this is all about. And um, I'm a resident of Denver, Colorado, actually a suburb uh, called Golden, Colorado. But I've the company that I built um, uh, was in Florida, in Orlando, called the Human Performance Institute, and I was like 40 years there, but I have a lot of family here, so I have kind of returned back home and um, sold all my places in Florida. I was in Naples for a while as well, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm an, I was an avid tennis player my whole life, uh, played basketball, played baseball for nine years. I just nutty athlete. And now I play a lot of golf. And, um, but I love hanging out with family. I have three sons and six, six boys and one girl, seven grandchildren. And um, I really enjoy spending time with them. And I do a lot of work, you know, um, with all kinds of things. And I love to write, writing another book. And it's, you know, just, I love, I'm a research guy, I'm a science guy. Mm -hmm. And I really like to dig into the details and to see what, what might be practical in terms of um, something that we can all benefit from that's maybe not fully evident in the research, but that's the emerging trend. Excellent. Well, fantastic. And uh, as you know, everyone on the call, we have chosen the power of full engagement as our book of the month or maybe even next couple months. Um, and it's already had a deep impact in many of us who are uh, open to facing the truth about the gap between who we want to be and who we really are, which is something you talk about in the book. And really the big premise of the book is that energy, not time, is the fundamental currency of high performance. And we are we absolutely agree with that. And my first question is this. I mean, Symmetry gets its name from the vision our founders had um, for sales and agency leaders to build a life with rhythms, right? This symmetry of work and rest. And we'll often talk about how we're wired to work from rest and not just rest from work as a way to think about these rhythms. And you talk a lot about us being rhythmic creatures. So if you can give us an overview of just the whole concept of the powerful engagement and how building rhythms within these four types of energy can really benefit you know, the, the high performing sales leaders that are on this call. 
Absolutely. So uh, when we set up the Human Performance Institute, my co-founder was Dr. Jack Roffel, who had his PhD in bioengineering. And we said, we're going to do a science-based approach. We're going to try to figure out what, you know, we love, I love hard science. And we decided that probably the most important um, scientific um, verifiable principle um, it, it, that is the foundation of physics, of chemistry, of is energy. And there's this thing about human energy. And it's something that's probably overlooked. We have this obsession with managing time. And we really started to challenge that in a very, very direct way that it really isn't managing. It's not how long you live. It's the energy you bring to the time you have aligned with what really matters, whatever the mission was. And so we built, that was the central construct in everything. And we really uh, put energy under a microscope and uh, the powerful engagement was one of the early iterations of that. And we you know we were quite surprised that it had the, the impact. It's been translated into 27 languages um, and it has, um, somehow it gets into people's skin. There's something that really, uh, and it is the basis of everything we did at the Human Performance Institute. But, you're absolutely right. It's not, you know, our energy is our greatest resource. And energy is not, it's not infinite. It's finite. We have to renew that energy. And all biopotentials in the human physiology are oscillatory. And they're oscillating between energy expenditure and energy renewal and energy recovery. If you cease to expend energy, you're, there's nothing there. Death is certain. If you simply recover and don't expend energy, it creates an arrhythmia. And all of the biopotentials that you want to think about, whether it's heart rate, blood pressure, everything is oscillatory. And we have to be oscillatory creatures in an oscillatory universe. And so stress and recovery are really a part of the continuum of life. And so if you're driven, you know, uh, drive is the single best predictor of performance. We worked with 17 number ones, took them to number one in the world. And we used everything from chess champions to Navy SEALs. And we basically help them understand how to oscillate more efficiently and effectively in their environments. And some environments are brutal. And in professional sport, you just can't, if you have, if you're driven, you just can't push the envelope because you're going to get hurt. And so if you just think if you're tough, you're going to get it. And that's the same with Navy SEALs. That's what we brought to the special teams was that there is an honoring here that you have to give. If you want to be a big, big spender of energy, you're going to have to figure out how to renew it. You can't just spend because you can spend yourself into oblivion. And what you end up with is you'll get overtrained. And all of you on this call are at risk of overtraining if you're highly motivated and you want to have a big life and all you do is push there's a risk there and you'll blow the system out and there's physical energy there's emotional energy there's mental energy and there's spiritual energy and ironically something that i never would have come to on my own without the data i'm a data guy spiritual energy was the best predictor of just about everything, all the outcomes that we wanted. And um, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're complicated, you know, creatures, <clears throat> but we're, you know, we're reservoirs of potential energy. And we wanna figure out how do we convert that to kinetic energy and do something with our lives? Well, the first thing we have to do is realize we have to figure out how to recover energy more efficiently so we mind the mechanisms of recovery and help people understand how do you get, how much time do you have? And between points and tennis, I developed what is called the 16 second cure. And that has gone viral all over the world. It's the way all the players in the world now train. It is the between point time in tennis. And uh, it's called 16 seconds because at the time we did the original research, Steffi Graf had the shortest uh, between point time that was still one of the top players in the world. And we realized that in just a few seconds, you can completely recalculate the system, recalibrate the system, 
And but you have to work and actually hone these rituals physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, so you can stay in the hot zone and not burn out, so that you can actually be a, a big time producer and sustain it for a lifetime and not always begrudge the fact that you have no life. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And on that, um, I'd love to just dig in for our leaders here because, um, Jim, you know, when we measure engagement here, because uh, we're data people too, we love data, we want love to make data driven decisions. We really have off the charts engagement scores. I think we're very outlier. I, I mean, you would know this from, uh, you know, the general Gallup research about many All people. All Gallup studies. Me. Sure. Yeah. We're at 88%. Uh, which is phenomenal i saw those stats and that's incredible <laughs> it is right and i keep i I'm, I'm telling everyone that and they they agree with me it's so good to hear you uh validate that and and now i could say you know hey a leading psychologist in the world on performance says we're outlier we we are outlier um our corporate office staff actually some of them are on the call today too i think we're at a, about a 93 percent so you know when i think about our organization and engagement right people are putting energy in, there's commitment, they're absorbed in the work. Um, on paper, we score high, but there's a reality, you know, as we talk to agents and even employees sometimes, there can still be this sense of overwhelm, right? We're balancing multiple priorities. So how can it be? It's a little confusing. I'm going to play devil's advocate that we can be so engaged and feel maybe still so overwhelmed. Do you have any insights or thoughts on how we can help with that? So it's such an interesting thing. You know, you have on one side, people, we, we have this bias to conserve energy. Our ancestors for thousands of years, those who wasted energy didn't make it till Tuesday when shelter and food resources and water were scarce. Now we have a lot of that, but it's very hard to get people to actually open up the vault of energy and just be all in. In a sense, we're kind of afraid if we do that, number one, people will find out we're not that good or we'll learn that, or we're just gonna burn up. So we don't, we don't sprint. So we developed this whole notion of the corporate athlete as a sprinter, not as a marathoner. A marathoner just grinds out every day, kind of hates what they're doing, but just gets through it. A sprinter goes like crazy, is all in, fully engaged, and then shuts down and then renews the energy. And that's the metaphor that we have used throughout. When we first came out with this, people thought we were duly crazy because everybody thought it was a marathon because we had to go 30 to 40 years of work. But the idea here is that if you have people engaged and you do, and full engagement is the greatest gift we have to give to the world because we take energy out of our bodies and give it to something outside of us that we care about. And so it's like we bring anything we give our energy to, we bring life to. You bring a lot of energy to your bicep by going in the gym and lifting weights. That spuns growth. Anything you give, you give uh, energy to compassion or love or a great relationship with your spouse. Um, if you want something that's extraordinary, you're gonna have to put extraordinary energy and effort. But sometimes it's hard for us to convince ourselves or our, the people we're leading to give that much. And if you've got the people to do that and you have, now you've got to focus on how do you get them to strategically carve up that environment so they don't burn up and actually at one point hate what they're doing. Parents who push their kids too much, they never give them a, a break. They're always on a, they're kind of a, you know, the same channel all the time, 24 seven, they're always talking this sport or that, the kids eventually come to hate it. Something that they loved at one point. And so when you have a lot on your plate, you have to give honor recovery, moments of recovery and periods of recovery with the same diligence that you are investing energy with. So things like physical energy, all energy comes from the physical body from the mitochondria of the cells. And that's fundamentally, it's called the Krebs cycle in the union of oxygen and glucose. And so anything you can do to increase oxygen transport that can increase uh, better nutritional elements, rest, sleep, hydration, those are the things we work with professional athletes. But I'm gonna tell you, your 
the demands on your energy as corporate athletes is greater than anything we ever saw in the professional world of sport. And that blew me away. This is a game and yours isn't. Yeah, that absolutely blew me away. I actually passed on your, uh, there was the Harvard Business Review article you did on the corporate (laughs) athlete early on with Tony. And, you know, the, the, the concept, you know, you really, uh, stretched our minds when you talk about how we, we always, we look to the elite, right? We look to the Navy SEALs or, or, you know, sports athletes, we, uh, sort of, you know, idolize and think how hard they work, but, you know, you made a point, like they have a short season and then they're off and recover and we're on all the time, you right? Have a, you're full on all the time. And yeah. then you have a family and you don't have a fallback. If you, if it doesn't work in real life, you can't go professional sports. Because that's not an option for most of the folks in the audience. No, it's so good. Um, Hey, before I transition to the next question, uh, Casey, Meredith, any questions from either of you? I know it's such a, these these things are things that we talk about. They're so in our DNA. I know Doug Zay, who's our chief people officer, he recommended this book uh, a couple of years ago. So some have been through it, but any observations so far, Meredith or Casey? Want to chime in? Yeah, I've got I've got about twelve questions that I want to ask you right now, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stay focused to what we were just talking to. Just in the research that you're currently doing, are you seeing anything different now post COVID? Are you seeing anything different with with um, professionals and the the sense of overwhelm coming out of a pandemic like we have, and kind of while wow, that's relevant to what we're dealing with right now. It's such a great question, and there's no there's no uh, question about it that this is our our playing field has changed. So if you are working remotely and you're in your home, you don't have all the little, you know, things that break up your day. You can work literally all day long, and you don't have this connection with other people. This one on one personal, you know, you have fun. You go walk the stairways. You climb the stairs together, you have a little bit of fun time in the little community watering hole, which is your kitchen in the, in the, in the, in the office and so forth. So people find that the, the sense of just being overwhelmed and then they have their family is often there. They're trying to manage family. It's a very different playing field. So you have to carve up the way we started all of our research was around looking at the demand characteristics of the environment you're in. If you're a Navy SEAL or Army Ranger, if you are someone who's, uh, you know, in a um, hostage rescue unit, um, or if you are someone who's a surgeon and constantly bombarded by another surgery, another surgery, emergencies, we look at the demand characteristics, and then we have to structure very, very consciously and intentionally ways for you to oscillate in that environment. You have to be able to change it when you get up in the morning, you know, dress like you would if you were going to work as opposed to just staying in the same clothes, making sure you have your meals timed in very, very regimented ways, have your exercise routine. And if you don't do that, the whole thing just descends on you like a black cloud. And all of a sudden, the things that you were so you know, kind of enthusiastic about before now, it's just, it's one day after another and they, there's no separation. So mm-hmm. you need to look at this and build an environment that's conducive so that you can do this, not for a week or for a month, but for the rest of your life. You have a sense of rhythm in this environment that's actually very user-friendly. And that is up to each individual and the company to help people understand how to design those environments so it doesn't just take the, the living life right out of you. Does wow. that make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, thank you. So good. Yeah, I mean, just what you said earlier too about giving the same a, a, attention and intention to those times of rest. I mean, that is such a incredible insight for us because again, um, you know, the, the demands of the day of the, the agent or agency builder on this call is such that they certainly could do that, right? They could do that. And, you know, we want that culture in our leaders where they understand the science in a simple way. And the science says that's counterintuitive uh, to wake up at, you know, 6 a.m. and plug away until 6 p.m. and have no rhythms of rest in that 
window. It's counterintuitive, right? Um, Absolutely. So, you know, you know it's interesting the the whole notion of recovery. I'll just mention a couple of things and sure. do your question. But you know, it's pretty obvious how you recover physically. You know, if you are sitting in a chair all day, you've got to move and move maybe for five or ten minutes away from your chair. Have a standing desk and move. Whatever you're doing physically, you need to change to a different channel. You need to get blood flow into those legs, and that takes it up into the the whole torso and, and, you know, the brain is a glutton for glucose and oxygen and the brain needs oxygen to work, to make good decisions. And so movement is extremely important. Strategic movement in a work environment is, is really important. And you need to move about every 90 minutes at a minimum. And then emotionally, um, particularly when you're encountering a lot of tough, difficult emotions, maybe very hard decisions, you know, things that actually, we call them, you know, kind of negative emotions, frustration, anger, resentment, all that stuff, those are highly toxic. Recovery is moving to a positive channel emotionally where the valence is positive. Anything you can do that actually, we have athletes use laugh tapes. We did a million things to help them go from a really kind of dark side to a really enjoyable side. Mentally, you simply have to change channels in terms of what you're thinking about. So you need to give those neurons that are burning energy a rest and go away from it and then come back to it. And you're much more creative, much more thoughtful. And then on the spiritual side, which is really the most important side, it's really kind of taking a break and reconnecting to why in the heck are you even doing this? Why should I even be out here working so hard? What am I really doing? And we found the most important element of that is what we call a transcendent purpose, a purpose that actually doesn't have a whole lot to do with you. The more you give your life and your energy to something bigger than yourself, the more you get back in terms of a feeling of fulfillment and satisfaction in your work. So we've learned that a purpose is the centerpiece of everyone's life. And the more it's not about you, the more you actually get a life. And when you have a self-transcendent purpose, the vault of your energy opens wide. You mm. become a big spender. Um, you stop being um, conservative and want to hoard energy. And people call it laziness. You don't want to spend it. You'd rather just not do anything, just hang out. Well, hanging out, in, like for instance, in retirement, if you do it for a short period of time, it's okay. For a long period of time, you know, the most dangerous period of of your life will be the six months following retirement if you get out of the reach of old man stress. Stress exposure is the stimulus for growth. If you don't have stress in your life, fundamentally, the game is over. Yes, stressed for six or stress for success, right? That's your axiom. I love that. That's your book. <laughs> exactly. um, okay, well, let's. I would love to take the last few minutes and really focus on a, an, an element of spiritual energy. Um, because again, we, we talk about that actually Meredith and Doug who are on this call and uh, another one of our amazing team mem members, we, we have a whole initiative now called the Ripple, which a big, big part of that is, is exactly what you're talking about, which is this sense of purpose and giving beyond yourself. And uh, we're really passionate about that. One of the things you mentioned in the in the book that we're going to read this month, I've, I've noticed in the chat, some people have already read it and uh, others are just now getting it and getting started. But you mentioned how character is is related to purpose, and I, you know, I don't know that we've thought about that before, and how how important character is for leaders. And I'm I'm going to commit to doing the leading with character leadership book, and uh, so probably later this year. So I might have a dive in deep with Dr. Dub's call uh, for people that want to uh, to to do leading with character. Um, but talk to us about character and, and leadership and spiritual energy. How, how, do, how does character have anything to do with like purpose and spiritual energy? So I have to pinch myself. I'm a performance psychologist. I've written multiple books on mental toughness, winning, you know, the whole deal all about, you know, everybody wants to get to the top of the mountain. For me to be talking about character as one of the, Pen, you know, is really the fundamental elements of sustained great performance is like it's a shock to me because it we had to follow the data and we 
we had some 400,000 people go through the Institute, tracking them, looking at what really stuck, what were the things that enabled them to do things that no one actually imagined was even possible. And we really found that it was the strength of character, things that were their integrity, their honesty, their humility, their compassion, their sense of kindness. Kindness kept surfacing. Um, you can get to the top of the mountain with a, with a strong purpose, with a great drive, and you can walk over dead bodies to get to the top. But people don't really celebrate your getting there. They don't want you there. Sustained performance over time, sustained leadership, people are watching. How do you treat people on the way to the top? More important than what you achieve is how you, you know, is the process, was the treatment of others on, on the path to achievement. So it's like we're all racing. We're racing to accomplish as much as we can in our lifetime. We want to achieve, but more important than what you achieve is who you became in the chase. What kind of human being did you become? Are you, are you more of a loving, kind person, a great father, great mother, a great community person, person who actually understands that without others, you'd be nothing, that so much of what you've gotten in life is a gift. So there has to be a great sense of gratitude a great sense of appreciation for all those that have helped you get there. And humility is really the precursor to gratefulness. You know, realize that, hey, I got a lot to learn here and I really appreciate those who can teach me something. So that's, that's a leader that we all want to be around. So the notion of character is really, you know, when I got into it, I was quite surprised. And the deeper we got, the more we realized that these are muscles. Integrity is a muscle, honesty is a muscle, kindness is a muscle, compassion. And you build those assets in the same way you build biceps and triceps and any other dynamic of the physical body. It's energy investment. And that energy investment is followed by periodic periods of recovery. And it's that oscillation of putting energy, and you put energy into it by thinking about it, by writing about it, by talking about it. There are lots of ways to invest energy. And in, in some, you know, it's like the mind is the body and the body is the mind. And we can build these assets from the inside out or from the outside in. But these are assets. I, this is my favorite exercise that I've ever done. And I've done thousands and thousands of these with people. I call it the tombstone exercise. If you really want to know how important character is, Go to the end of your life. You know, Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. He's 100% correct. So we, we go to the end and we have you at the end of your life when you have passed. And we actually have you reflect on what you would like to have carved, etched on that tombstone that reflected who you were when you were here for real. And that then we start moving backwards in time because those are assets that you're just not going to get without a lot of really hard work. And look at what, what are those representing and what we find over and over again, that it's not how many gold medals you got as, a, as an Olympian. It's not how many trophies you've made as a, as a world-class athlete. It's not how many uh, million dollar bonuses that you received as an executive. It's not what you, whether you had the corner office or anything else, whether you were, you were achieved VP by the age of 35. What you want on that tombstone is a connection to other people. Mm. Person who inspired others, who really was a person who, um, you know, brought always uh, joy and happiness to others, to, uh, was a person of integrity or honesty someone who was truly loving and caring. Yeah. And when you have that, you can move back and then you, okay, what does that mean for me today as a leader? I want to, that's what I call getting home. You can determine what home is by going to the end and realizing this is where I want to end up when it's all over. Well, I'll tell you, Jim, thank you. I, I mean, <clears throat> for us sitting here, we're, I, I'm, I'm emotionally moved. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I literally had tears in my eyes because this is so our heart and message and desire for not only for us to embody as leaders in, in this company, but everyone on this call 
just that, I mean, character and its relation to high performance, but even beyond performance, like what really matters at mm. the end. And again, we, we, um, we just celebrate the hard, hard work you've done. And, and it's, it's funny, uh, you know, we're, we were actually in Denver last year and we're going to be there again with 5,000 friends in August. So maybe, you know, if you can walk down the street and come hang with us, I might be talking to you if you want to come and uh, come hang out with us and, and uh, talk on a stage. In front well, of it's us. really refreshing to see um, a company like yours with uh, so many, you know, extraordinary people that have committed themselves to this direction. It's uh, it's really uh, very exciting for me to, to learn about this and to hear what you have to say. No, thank you much. Over at Founders, any final thoughts for Jim? No, I just I had one one quick um, comment that seems a little unrelated, but I listened to a podcast that you were on this morning with uh, Tim Ferriss, and I already loved your message. <clears throat> My wife already loved your message, but I have a question for you that's going to make her love you even more. Do you have a favorite um, movie or show or actor in that movie or show that you like to watch sometimes to recharge? <clears throat> so what is what is my favorite movie of all time? Yes. Oh boy, let me think about that. I mean, I have so many different genres that I enjoy. Well, there's a there's a movie. Some people may call it a movie. Other people may call it a mini series. But you 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 talked about it on the uh, Tim Ferriss show, Lonesome Dove. No, is it not the greatest yeah. piece of art ever created? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a stretch, but. I well, I, I mean, I love the Western genre and I, I'm a great fan of uh, Lonesome Dove and the return to Lonesome Dove mm -hmm. um, because it's I just I love movies that are, you know, deeply emotional and actually bring you to a place you can't normally get in life. Um, mm -hmm. And but it leaves you with an optimistic sense that mm -hmm. there, there, there is a there is a sense of hope for all of us. And Without hope, we don't have much. So I uh, I love it when there are difficult things that are represented in, in the show or the movie, but people transcend them. They figure out how to get through them. They dig deep into their spirit and figure out a way to overcome obstacles you can't imagine. So I have about a hundred of those movies that I really enjoy. And I, I see, I watch them all the time to, to lift my spirits and to move me. And some of them I'll cry multiple times yeah. in some of these movies because they just move me so much but that's what i, I love to be moved mm. love it love it i think robert duvall's character in that uh oh, robert that duvall movie. is one of the greatest actors of all time for yeah. sure for yeah. sure love for sure. we um we can't thank you enough for for spending some time with us we will definitely be in touch to see um if our calendars can match up to do it again soon and um i just that i don't know if you've you, you haven't been able to see it, but the, the chat down below has been blowing up. Casey and I and Meredith have, have all been getting a lot of texts of, of gratitude. Uh, and so we just want to offer that gratitude back to you for taking some time with us. Thank you so Thank much. You so this much. is very meaningful. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. I'd love to see you guys just go to the very top and stay there forever. Love it. Thank Sounds you, Jim. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy Thank your day. Bye-bye. Well... Bye. That was a uh, great way to kick it off. Yeah. If you're just now joining us, um, don't worry. We've got it recorded. You can go back and watch it. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you do that because oh, um, what a great kickoff to talking about the the book of the month, right? Mm -hmm. Or the book of the maybe two months we decided. The book of the year. Honestly, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Good way to kick off the word of the year too with Engage. My First question to him was going to be how's how's August in Denver sounds exactly. I'm <laughs> all about that. I I'm hopeful we could pull that off. Yeah, that awesome. we'll send a car to come pick you up. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, we'll dig into that hey, one. Hey, I just want to take a minute. B does made that happen. Oh, um, that was I mean thirty minutes. I feel like we could have spent six hours, six yeah. days, sixty days with that with that gentleman and um, what he has to offer. So thank you for just. That, taking making that happen buddy oh, so thankful honored and again i mean so much depth around all the topics you know the character one is going to be so important for us this year too uh as leaders and uh that that is it that's the there is no secret sauce i mean it really is that integrity humility generosity triad that takes us to the moon and uh you know thankful for you guys modeling that so yeah 
have a great national call. We're back off to planning. So cheers. Good, inter good interview, Dr. Dub. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dubs. Or Dr. Dr. Would you prefer Dr. Dubs or Dr. W? You know, I, it's a good question. Depends what we're marketing. I, I, diving deep with Dr. <laughs> Dubs sounds like a fun call, you know. I'm, I'm game for it. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll noodle around on it. All right. All right. I, you guys always crush it in that area. So I'll, I'll just, I'll receive it. You just think about it. I'll just take whatever it's it is. Our, it's one of our biggest strengths. It, it is. is. Nicknames. It is. Nicknames. Yeah, one of our own strengths. All right. Peace out, <laughs> gents. Bye. Thank you, buddy. Um, Sean Boatman is saying, actually, you're not very good at giving nicknames because we oh, named the Boatman. The Boatman. I thought it was really good, but. I think it's one of our better ones. <laughs> Um, every time I hear his name, though, I always think of the, uh, I think it was England, right, that let the citizens name the big warship, and they came back with Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> Bodie McBoatface, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's... There's a danger in that. There's some danger yeah. in that, for sure. Uh, man, we got some good stuff to uh, to cover. Right. You and I have been texting back and forth, maybe before we get into the call today, yeah. during Dr. Lair's, um part there and we had a call with first the advisory board and then the uh directs and we had to kind of break some news to them that we were not canceling but we were pausing destinations for one year so that we could rethink how we wanted to do it um and we weren't the only ones. I'm hearing from Mutual of Omaha. I'm hearing from Forsters. I'm hearing from other carriers that have had to kind of rethink things too because it just got to be two things, really big and really expensive, right? But after hearing this and hearing from some advisory board members, it makes me want to rethink that and figure out, is there a way for us to be able to do it? Because um, I think there's so much value in the ability to uh, for us all to have this connection piece yep. that we would certainly be missing. Right. So luckily well, for us, we got the advisory board coming in in a, in a couple of weeks. It will look different if we can do anything. Yep. The good news is, though, is we do have a big contest that we're getting ready to announce today. We also have a couple of trips on the books that are going to be symmetry only that we'll be announcing probably within another week or two. Yep. Um, so I don't want to give any hints away on that. There still will be some trips that you can earn. Yep. It's just when you start taking, you know, a couple hundred people. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it gets, it limits on where we can go yep. and we don't want to just start going to, you know, holiday. Yeah. yeah the holiday and um, the Hojo's. Well, it also works. You know, we used to roll out destinations at the beginning of the year because our conference was at the beginning of the year too. And uh, as you guys know, Denver is going to be in August again. And uh, I think the next couple few years, we're probably going to try to keep it in the summer. You know, so much goes into it. Um, investing into putting on a big conference, like a, so many of you guys experience in Denver. And there's just a lot of risks slapping that thing in the winter, no, no matter where you are, you know, especially with travel and air, air the way it is. So We've intentionally moved our conference, um, our big national conference pull together to the summer. So that gives us uh, that gives us four or five, six months, Brandon, to figure out retool destinations and hopefully come to the table with you guys uh, on something really exciting. So yeah, yes. gives us a little time. Thank you. Love that. Um, all right, man. Let me get in.